Good afternoon, everybody. I thought, well, since everybody's here, we might as well kick off. So it uh, gives us extra drinking time in the bar. Uh, what I'm going to do is run through a whole range of different kind of considerations, both from a technical point of view, but also these other points of view. And I think most importantly, this is really a kit show. We're looking at the technology owl out there. So what I'm going to cover are some of the technical environmental, but most important of all, really, it's the behavioral ones. And what I mean by that is how you look after yourself and your kit in these environments. Now, hot and dry, to be fair, I always regard as one of the easiest things to work in, one of the easiest environments to work in. And before you head to the Sahara, there's one thing you should always remember. Visit B&Q and make sure you buy a damn good paintbrush because they are the most effective things for getting sand out of cameras. One of the other considerations, though, in hot, dry environments is trying to keep hydrated. So if making sure you don't actually put your camera inside a vehicle or, inside, or outside in direct sunlight at the height of the day, you've got to keep hydrated. And to be fair, that was my biggest challenge on this job. I was working in Oman, and it was 48 Celsius. And it was a job and a half just to keep hydrated. And in this environment, I was putting literally ice cubes under my helmet in order so I could actually still film and photograph during the course of the day. Hot and wet. That has a whole bunch of different challenges. And to be fair, the biggest challenges are a little bacteria and microbes and fungus that are going to grow on you and are going to grow on your camera kit. So one of the biggest challenges there is actually trying to keep your equipment dry. And you'll see a bit of a recurring theme coming through my presentation. Dry bags and microfiber travel towels. They are superb for keeping your kit dry. Forget about silica gel, guys. It's a one-hit wonder. The beauty with microfiber dry towels, you can use them time and time again. So at camp, you can dry them out, seal them up into poly bags, and use them again. One of the other great things, though, working in a rainforest, occasionally, you do get a, a, a break in the canopy. So that affords you the chance to actually dry out your kit, do a bit of sunbathing, and hopefully dry out your camera. One of my favorite environments to work in is cold and dry. This image here is from when I was working on a blizzard race to the pole at 10,000 feet on the Greenland ice cap. Consistently cold, consistently dry, minus 25 and below. But the biggest challenge there is actually trying to cope with the extreme winds. Pitarak winds are coming through at 75 miles an hour, so you actually need clothing and equipment that can withstand that. And here, when I was actually filming on Blizzard Race the Pole for the BBC, you might notice that on this tripod, there's no spreader. The actual ground spreader on the tripod shattered. So literally, the plastic on the tripod was no longer plastic. So for the rest of the trip, I had to somehow cope with shooting without a spreader. Cold and wet. To be fair, that's Britain. And we talk about going on these amazing location productions to far-flung corners of the world. And to be honest, it's blighty. It's the hardest place to actually get stuff done. And in particular, Scotland in winter. Because what you're suffering there is f constant freeze-thaw. So as you go up into the mountains, it'll get progressively colder. The rain that you've had on you will actually freeze. It'll freeze on your camera. Or the camera will get encased. And then as you descend, or as things warm up, which they generally do, in particular on the west coast of Scotland, it'll all melt, and your camera will get wet, and you get condensation inside your lens. So these are the things that you actually have to be aware of while you're away on location. When you're working in a marine environment, Basically, I take it as red that your camera is going to get trashed. So I hermetically seal it, either in a hard case, or I use a UMarine Marine uh, flexible case. But bear in mind, those flexible cases are not flexible when the temperature drops. 
One thing I, I use a lot, though, are radio mics in that context. So I actually use a case that can actually encapsulate my radio mics. So when I mic up my contributors, then there are no cables and no issues of gaps in my co uh, cover for the camera. The whole unit is completely sealed. Mountains. They present a whole host of different problems and challenges. One of those is scale. So here we are at Everest Base Camp on the north side in Tibet. And I was working there on a series for the Discovery Channel. From Base Camp to Advanced Base Camp, it takes two days to walk once you've acclimatized. It then takes a further two months of progressive climbing and acclimatization to be able to stand a chance of getting to the summit. And the other thing, obviously, lower partial pressure of oxygen. At 8,959 meters, Everest is way beyond where most mortals can actually climb to, never mind even survive there for any prolonged periods. So you've got to bear that in mind. And on that job, on all mountain jobs, I've learned that gravity always wins. No matter how much technology is out there, you fall off, you drop your kit, you've got to make sure you keep it with you. You can't afford to drop your equipment. So when I'm working in hazardous environments, I, keep, I have lanyards, so I wear a, a, a body system, and all my camera gear, all my accessories are all on lanyards clipped to a harness that I will wear. So if I have to look after myself, then I can let go of my cameras, and my cameras are not going to go anywhere. One thing that no one's invented so far are anti-gravity boots. So if you do find any, please let me know. So in, in summary on those environments, it's really, in essence, we're looking at managing that moisture, both in our personal clothing, because if we're actually working in cold environments, we sweat, we perspire, that moisture, that perspiration, will actually freeze within the clothing. If we allow any moisture to get into the camera, that will also freeze, and once it thaws, it's going to fog up the lens. Now, you might think we're going back to a polar ice cap here, but actually this is the frozen Arctic Ocean. And it is an ocean. That's not just a melt water pond. That is actually an open water lead. And what you're seeing there is the inky black water that is four kilometers of blackness in the Arctic Ocean. So paradoxically, this environment is both extremely cold, but also extremely humid. And especially when the leads, when the gaps in the ice break open like this, it's very, very humid. It's almost like a marine environment. And here I am using a totally waterproof camera. So my main uh, XF cameras, the 305 and the XF100, have been packed away in waterproof dry bags. And then I'm using a small um, waterproof camcorder as I'm actually getting pulled and I've rafted up across this open water lead. But here I am with one of the XF100s. And a lot of people say, well, if you're going to go in cold environments, you need an outside camera and an inside camera. Yep, for sure, I've done that for years. However, my task on this job was to tell a story like no other in the Arctic to tell a story about what it's like to survive and what it's like to work in an uh, in a Arctic environment. It was an international scientific expedition. And to do that, I had to film what was going on inside the tent. It was non-negotiable. So in the early part of the expedition, the cameras would freeze up like this. So again, I'd re resort to my small, totally waterproof camera, managed to keep this one going, get my paintbrush out, get all the condensation on, dry it out, and I'd make sure that no one got into the tent. I'd get the cookers on, keep it as dry as possible, the atmosphere. But this was actually the early few days of the expedition. It was minus 52 outside and still about minus 50 inside the tent. As things warmed up, it was easier to manage. But as you can see in the background, I've got another dry bag, and what I did 
was actually strip the camera apart, wrap it up into these dry towels, put it inside one dry bag, then in another, and it's almost like a Japanese tea ceremony, and then that went inside my sleeping bag. So I could do all the actuality shooting first thing in the morning when my camera was warm and dry. And I had to keep that going for 10 weeks, day in, day out. It was a complete, merciless regime. What I want to do now is just share a clip of uh, what the expedition was like. In March 2011, four of the world's toughest explorers were dropped into the frozen Arctic Ocean. Their mission? To measure the thickness of sea ice in the most extreme conditions on the planet. Minus 20 at the moment, it's nothing. This is great. Braving temperatures of minus 75 degrees, they forced their way through Arctic storms towards the North Pole to collect data that will provide the blueprint for our future. It's melting from below as well as above. Their bodies under constant attack. My eyelids are beginning to freeze up. Their habitat the most hostile of all. And our cameras alongside them every step of the way. It's closing in on us. That's how it goes. It's like some sort of roulette game. In six remarkable weeks, these hardened experts were at the mercy of the brutal Arctic weather. This is just ridiculous. Putting their lives on the line. We misjudged the length of rope. Are the sharks in the Arctic Ocean? Exactly. Pretty sure. Great whites, right? Sacrificing their safety in the name of science, this epic journey took them into the heart of the North Pole. We are still in the middle of nowhere. So, and where are we going? Closer to somewhere. Cut from the toughest cloth and spurred on by the thrill of risking it all, they are the mavericks of elite exploration. Six o'clock, people, it's time to get up. It's the dawn of another day, the demise <laughs> of the bag. I thought you wrote when you were a young chap to Sir Ranulph Fine saying, Sir Ranulph, I want to be a polar explorer. Is that... <laughs> I was obviously mistaken at the time, wasn't I? I hadn't actually been to the poles. <laughs> He thought Santa was here and his little rain and his reindeer. I'm happy to work hard, but I don't like the cold much. You'll see every dramatic twist and turn. I can't believe it's right. As the team cross one of the coldest places on Earth. It's very cold, it's minus 52. Pushing the boundaries of human endeavor. I feel as if I've lost a stone or more. Facing conditions the body and mind has rarely experienced. From the threat of frostbite and exhaustion. They must fight through blizzards with the ever-present danger of polar bears. I had my head down, I was looking, skiing, and there they are. Some polar bear tracks. And the constant threat of falling through the ice. The whole raft of ice was bouncing up and down. If somebody falls there, they're going in. Captured in high definition and a worldwide exclusive, this is North Pole, living on thin ice. So we're just in the process of actually completing the post-production on that, and it'll be released later this year as a feature documentary. So uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll see it in a cinema near you. A lot of people have asked me, though, that was one trip that we did back in 2011, and they were saying, well, why didn't you get involved on this expedition, The Coldest Journey, with this, this chap? If you don't recognize him, this is Rand Fiennes. Um, I, to be fair, I can cope with most extremes. However, there's one extreme that doesn't really sit with me that well. Well, it's politically not correct. It's, and I almost don't dare say this to you, but because we have so many applicants for some of the really difficult expeditions, we haven't got time. So we have a rule about who we won't even bother to select. And uh, again, I don't want it to be offensive to anyone, but we won't take people who are from Yorkshire. We won't take people who wear spectacles. Um, I do wear spectacles, but I obviously make an exception for myself. Now, if you've not al already guessed, I'm from Yorkshire. So basically, on Rand's trips, I'm not going to get invited. And sadly, I did hear, though, and I have, to be fair, I've got great admiration and respect for the guy. He's been an amazing explorer and an, an amazing ambassador for polar travel. And I heard, unfortunately, a couple of days ago that uh, he had succumbed 
to frostbite even on the training phase of his expedition. So to be fair, even the great and the good can succumb uh, to these conditions. You just have to remain vigilant 24 seven. Um, that's one fundamental bit of advice uh, I need to share with you. The other thing is that uh, we all know that cameras and tapes and, and everything else has changed. The formats have changed over the years. And when I started shooting on HD, I was shooting on HD cam on the big shoulder mounted cameras. One of the great things is though, is that you can still now shoot HD, shoot 50 megabits a second HD on small cameras. Admit admittedly, if you're shooting uh, on a large shoulder mounted camcorder, you might be using an HJ11 lens, so one of the big Canon broadcast lenses. But this little unit here, the XF100, truly outperformed itself. I took two of these cameras on the expedition for all the principal photography and then a little XA10, which is this one. So the first one was 50 megabits a second. This is 24 megabits a second AVC HD. These cameras are bomb proof. Uh, I was totally gobsmacked on how clean the imagery was. And I actually use these for a lot of now covert filming uh, on a number of projects that I've been doing. I also shoot a lot on DSLRs and I've, I've got a 5D Mark III and I use that for a lot of corporate work but also intercutting stuff uh, for TV productions. And I think the vast improvement, and even, I don't think even Canon proclaimed this, I've used this in total pouring rain. I was photographing the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc and it literally rained for 24 hours and I was using a Kata rain cover. The thing steamed up, the damn good cameras, but it was basically so cold and my hands, I was trying to keep my hands warm, the whole thing steamed up, took the cover off, and I just kept shooting. And it, as long as you don't actually use your zoom that much, so I tend to use prime lenses in very challenging conditions. The camera body was fine and the lens was fine and I was still able to shoot in pouring rain. One important thing here as well is the advances in lightweight rucksacks and lightweight camera protection. And also rather than just having a camera bag, it's different ways of, uh, of carrying your camera kit. And here I selected the Kata torso pack. And the beauty with that is I could actually ski at the same time as holding one of the camcorders close to my chest. And any opportunity, because I was shooting an observational documentary, I could literally rip open the top of the uh, camera bag, pull out the camera, and get ready and shoot. So actually, a piece of kit like that made a fundamental difference to the way I could actually shoot and the way I could actually tell this story. Another consideration was the rubble, the environment I was going through. Most people think the Arctic Ocean is as, like the South Pole, it's as flat as a pancake. This is pressure ridges building up that you've got to fight a one piece of ice fighting against the other piece of ice and literally just creates a whole mass of jumbled blocks. Well, in order to keep the rest of my broadcast kit safe in that, what I did, rather than taking pelly cases with me, which we know are bloody bomb proof, but actually very heavy, I used the Kevlar monocoque construction of my sledge, of my pulk, and then actually used the foam, the pluck and, uh, pick and pluck foam from a pelly case and built a secure um, case inside the sledge with a waterproof bag that went over the top of it. So if my sl the sledge floats, but even if the sledge got waterlogged, it was damaged underneath and that started to go down, the rest of my camera gear would stay uh, dry and actually would float. So this is the level of detail you've got to go into sometimes on uh, these remote and challenging location productions. Carbon fiber, tripods have improved massively. And as you can see from uh, this tripod here, I don't use ground spreaders anymore. Always use a mid-leg spreader. Um, early, tr early carbon fiber would shatter and snap in cold conditions, but the Manfrotto tripods I've used over the years have proven themselves uh, beyond doubt. Everybody asks me about power. How on earth do you keep your batteries going? How on earth do you keep your cameras going at minus 45? Well, I have, 
I've specially produced single-use lithium batteries. So these are bespoke productions. You can't buy them off the shelf, and I actually procured them specifically for this job. I use those in really cold conditions. They're only single-use. You can't recharge them. So imagine it as a Duracell on steroids. For the rest of their work, I use the biggest battery I can lay my hands on applicable to the camcorder I'm using. So these are the Canon 975 batteries. But again, if you're looking at budgeting, the budget for the batteries, I needed 22 of these, and I'll let you do the maths, 22 at 235 quid each plus VAT. It's a lot of money on batteries. And because it was so cold, I couldn't recharge them. The chemistry of the batteries won't let the juice in. If you're using a Jenny, if you're using a uh, solar panel, you have to preheat your batteries. So what I did is calculate the power consumption I needed for the entire expedition and took the batteries that I needed. It was that simple. Sometimes you have to think laterally when you're working on these jobs. You have to strip away all potential complication and just go with what you know will work. The other thing as well, and one thing I know that really does work, are these cards. It was an absolute game changer for me when I went from tape-driven cameras to file-based media. A lot of people regard it as a bit of a headache when it comes to actually workflow. For me, it was a godsend because I could use cameras that use significantly less power. And also, when I'm using small cameras for observational documentary filming, there's no camera noise. And in almost 100 hours I shot on location, I only had one card misread, and that was because of human error. And to be fair, it was only one clip misread. As you can see, where you put the actual card into the slot, I had powder snow rammed in there in the midst of a blizzard. And I got a card read error. But when I was back to the hotel, ready to fly home, I looked at the card, set the Rescue Pro software going, and the thing worked beautifully. So you've just got to trust the media you're working with. What I'm going to do is share a little clip just to show you how I got on for the first few days of the expedition. So here I am on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. The ambient air temperatures minus 32. Uh, we've got a very strong wind blowing and the wind chill is down to minus 50. And as I'm speaking, my eyelids are actually beginning to freeze up. Now, in these extreme conditions, I'm attempting to make a film about the Catlin Arctic Survey. And to record this and to document it, uh, I've chosen to use the Canon XF100. Uh, this little beauty uh, weighs just over a kilogram. And the reason I'm taking such a small camcorder is because I'm going to have to pull the entire lot, all my filming equipment with me, in a sledge, in a pork behind me. Going back to the camcorder, it records onto solid state compact flashcards. One of the benefits of that is that it actually reduces power consumption. There are no moving parts in the camera, unlike tape driven cameras. And uh, one of the extraordinary things is it records full 50 megabits a second HD video. So what I'm attempting to do is be one of the first embedded director cameramen operating at the North Pole and operating in such extreme and challenging conditions. And the conditions were extreme and exceptionally challenging. And that's not bad audio recording. It was literally like standing next to a jet plane taking off at Heathrow. Such is the ferocity of that wind. Um, and you've just got to remain focused. There, my skin, I, in order to do that piece of camera, I exposed the skin. And those little, little bits of opaque skin that you could see growing stayed with me for the rest of the expedition. So 10 weeks later, I, they didn't heal. So it's, it's a particularly unforgiving environment to work in. Now, one of the things about technology, it's always moving on. And um, SanDisk uh, produced 
uh, SSD, solid state drives, and some of the ca camera manufacturers are already adopting those, uh, especially when they're looking at shooting Super HD or 4K. And then also with CFast. So I think if you want to learn more about this and learn about more, more of the opportunities for shooting 4K, talk to the guys at Canon, talk to the guys at ARRI, and also talk to the guys at SanDisk. One of the other things as well, I, when I picked up the um, 5D Mark III, I, it said somewhere right at the bottom of the, of the manual, it can shoot at 25,600 ASA. And you look at it and you go, you must be taking the mic. So I just thought I'd go out and play. And I was shooting through the night this, this ultra race called the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc. And this image is shot at 25,600 handheld, and all I did with the illumination on the floor, I put my head torch on a jacket on the floor and handheld it. And I just wanted to try and capture the essence of what it was like to travel through the night. And I started to play and paint with light and move the camera and that. And I've got all sort of abstract images. But this is the kind of, I'd regard as the most representative of the runners going through. There's grain there, to be fair, but actually, you know, it's not much worse than a 400 ASA film slide. So I'm gobsmacked on how good the performance of these cameras are, the large sensor cameras. Also, as well, LED lights. I always have a stack of these little Manfrotto uh, rechargeable uh, lights in my bag. The beauty is you can cluster them together, and some you can recharge, and some you can actually put either AAA batteries or, or AA batteries in. Always useful to have on uh, in your camera bag. And I can put four together, cluster those, and actually just use them with a laser light reflector. So they're brilliant. Communications. It's always been a big issue when you're working in remote, lo play, uh, remote locations. Because you want to keep your uh, series director happy. You, you want to keep your exec happy. So you want to tell them how you're getting on. Well, this is how we coped back in the late 90s when I was working on a production for Channel 5 up at the Magnetic North Pole. Nothing out here is easy. The satellite phone has frozen. Peter takes the risk of trying to cook it back to life. Come on, baby, true. do your thing. Do your thing, everyone's crossing their fingers. Grab some satellites. Come on, get your satellite, get your satellite. Antenna link down, okay. Now, way overdue reporting, they expect to hear the dreaded sound of an aircraft at any moment. Then at last, contact. OK, fine. Uh, which frequency can I talk to the pylon? Can I talk to on uh, 5281.5, over? And just in the nick of time, the flight is stopped. So the fact that we actually couldn't communicate back to base almost cost us the entire expedition. Because if the plane had to come out, we couldn't send, afford to send it back and then get to our final destination, the magnetic North Pole, and finish the expedition. And you can see where he was trying to angle it. That was an Inmarsat sat phone. Inmarsat's a network designed specifically for shipping. And to be fair, you don't find many ships all the way up there. But what you do find now on polar expeditions are these. Iridium phones, so high Earth orbiting satellites. And the great thing is that I was working on a series last year for Channel 5 called North Pole Ice Airport. And a lot of the guys on the expeditions were using the new Iridium Extreme. It's waterproof, it's shockproof, and it has a lithium ion battery, which is a dam site better working in cold conditions. But a lot of the guys were also using these little Wi Fi devices, also produced by Iridium. Just plug them in. in. To be fair, in the cold, there are issues with the cable. But if you can manage that, you create a little Wi-Fi hotspot. And what they were doing was uploading blogs, uploading photographs. If you're using video clips, one of the best things I've found for uploading to blog sites is recording your video on a BlackBerry. During the course of the Catlin Arctic Survey, we uploaded our, all our video footage via satellite on a BlackBerry because it seems to have the optimum compression 
of the video in order to get it up over the network. Otherwise, it would have cost us an inordinate amount of money just to get this video back to a website. So sometimes the technology is great, but actually you've got to look at the underlying cost as well on location. Um, I'm a real advocate of keeping things simple, and I just want to share this with you. Another successful day on this first phase of the expedition, and uh, just managing to film. Um, the screen on the other Canon camera, the XF100, that's, uh, I can't even see through it. The camera's working, but the uh, sensor doesn't seem to want to play. Works fine up until about minus 25. And then below that, it's just not functioning. This little unit, I'm still managing to, uh, to film using this. And then for me, this is the most important thing on the expedition. Uh, well, for my filming at least, just a pen, an old pen, uh, and a bit of cord, and then I can actually operate while I've got full down mitts on. And uh, the current temperature is about uh, minus 37, and uh, the, there's a really weird ghosting effect on the camera now. But uh, we had a full day sledging, and we try to retrieve uh, some information, some data from the ice, but it wasn't forthcoming. The reason being, after four full flights on uh, the drill on the auger, the, uh, oh, uh, that's about 15 feet, four meters, 4.4 uh, meters, we still couldn't get through. So uh, we can't drop any instruments this evening. I've got to put my hood up. It's getting really cold. So you might have heard the expression mind-numbingly cold. Well, I couldn't think. It was so difficult to literally put my hood up. But the saving grace for my expedition was a bunch of these pen styluses. And it was, a, to be fair, I've got to give it to a friend, uh, the credit to a good friend of mine, a guy called Kevin O'Gello. He's a, he's a director cameraman based in uh, Holland. I'd used these before, but actually I was so busy organizing everything else, I'd forgot to take them on this trip. He said, don't forget your pens. And I had pockets here on my uh, sal polar salopettes, and I had spare ones, so if I dropped one in the snow, I wasn't gonna try and find it, I could get another one and use it. They're all on little lanyards. The most important thing was, I never took my gloves off in 10 weeks, at all. Now that was particularly cold. I started out at minus 37, th minus 38. When I was filming, it was minus 43, and the sun was going down. By the time I'd packed up the camera, packed up the tripod, and got in the side of the tent, the temperature had gone off a thermal cliff. It was minus 52 Celsius. If you've got exposed skin for 30 seconds, it will be frostbitten beyond redemption. It is, you, it's almost like being an astronaut. That's the, the closest thing I can share, or if, you, if you're a, a real nitrox deep sea diver, is that then you've got no margin for error, and it really does focus the mind. The other thing, a couple of final bits now, access. We all like traveling around the world and going to these weird and wonderful places. This is a photograph uh, of an airport, a very famous airport. It's Lukla in Nepal, in the Kumbu region. And it's been classed as the world's deadliest airport on several TV series. But this photograph was taken back in the early 90s, back in 91. And now it's been tarmacked. And now you won't find any yaks wandering across your airstrip. So that is a lot safer and a lot more civilized. Getting around, I first traveled in these when the Iron Curtain fell. This is a Russian 
MI8 helicopter. Then, I don't know what held them together, but now operating up to the North Pole, up to the geographic North Pole, there's kind of the Russian equivalent of the Civil Aviation Authority, make sure that these things are maintained and looked after. The other thing as well, engines, really important to get to your place so you can actually do the filming. The internal combustion engine on these skidoos has improved massively, but actually when you're driving them, the best thing that you need is a bunch of gaffer tape to make sure your nose doesn't get frostbitten. And then comes down to personal equipment. This is the garb that I had on Blizzard Race the Pole. We had modern down clothing and all the best kit available. And this is what Bruce Parry and the team had that we were filming. They were reenacting the 1911 Scott Amundsen race to the South Pole. And they were wearing cotton ventile. And you might think, what on earth? But actually, when you're sledge hauling, the amount of heat that you generate is massive. So what you want to do is have light clothing that can get rid of that perspiration really easily, but is also windproof. Cotton ventile is still used by the British Antarctic Survey. The only problem that they had was insulation. Their wool overcoats just didn't do the job. One of the amazing things, though, about modern technical fabrics is you can do a rather daft things with them. That is just downright crazy. There's a period over three days where all we could see beyond us was just rubble and gaps in the sea ice. And we just christened it Venice. And we spent three days of our lives in these immersion suits, literally walking as far as this, uh, this here little theater area, and then going to another gap in the water, swimming through that. And the nice thing is, though, that water is uber buoyant. And it's a damn sight warmer than the air temperature. So even though it sounds completely crazy, it was actually became to be a perversely enjoyable experience. Literally wearing our orange Teletubby suits and then going like seals almost from iceberg to iceberg. Three days we worked at it. Now, a lot of people ask, what are the most important things to take on a teleproduction, to take on a photographic assignment? And... Um, I think over the years I've distilled it down to these two things. And why I always regard the sense of humor as important, well, this is why. What is going on here? <laughs> Bill <I> Coates. <laughs> I can't get out. Hang on, Phil. Let me get another angle. Why is it, Tyler Fish, that every time... <laughs> okay. Every time it goes catastrophically wrong, you're there <laughs> with your camera. <laughs> it's just not fair. Just like other superheroes, <laughs> Phil, that's how I operate. <laughs> I will need some help to get out. All right, hang on then. Let me get a picture of you. <laughs> And then we'll have to get the end of the story, because this is the middle. <laughs> so when, that start, when it started to slip and break, so the whole pressure ridge started to literally disintegrate. And at that same instant, my sledge was pulling back. I thought I was about to break my back. But actually, I don't know if anybody skis here, 
But what I've learned to do certainly over the years is when I'm skiing and I know I'm going to fall or I know I'm going to plummet off the side, you've just got to relax. And it was almost like this adrenaline euphoria had came over me and I just got the giggles. Now, if you can survive better than your kit, and on this one after 10 weeks, I think my kit won and I came a close second. Thankfully, within three days of getting home, these actual patches cleared up. But um, I felt a bit of a ghost after 10 weeks on the ice. But it was a successful trip. And the science has just been submitted for publication. And the film will be coming out later this year. And I think you can appreciate that what I try and do is hopefully get things right most times in extreme locations. However, it doesn't always work like that. You ready? Yep. Sun's coming up. Oh. <laughs> Phil Coates, are you okay? <laughs> That's how not to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much.